Let's take a minute. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for all that you've done for us. We are grateful for the way that you're at work in our lives. We are grateful for the gift of the scriptures. We just pray as we think together about the scripture and what it means for us, that you might be a present in our thoughts, in our hearing, in our understanding. We are grateful for all that you've done for us. We pray your blessing upon this word in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most tempting things in life to do, and especially when you're a person who um, maybe thinks of themselves as someone with, you know, uh, as a person of integrity and as a person who um, does what they set out to do, people who perceive themselves as having a, a strong moral compass and a good set of values. One of the greatest temptations we have is to do the right thing for the wrong reason. To pursue the right ends, but to pursue them via the wrong means. A lot of times this happens when we allow one value that we hold to become the most important without balancing it against some of the other values that are equally important. We see examples of this every day. It could be maybe in your workplace, leader of a business, leader of an academic institution, leader of a nonprofit, leader of a church, comes in to an organization, and maybe they're new, maybe they get a new role, and they perceive that something is not working well. And so immediately they say, we got to fix this realizes that big changes are required in order to fix this, whatever this is. And then just begins that process of change without ever taking the time to find out from the people what those changes are going to mean without ever talking with those that they work with about, you know, how people's jobs, how people's ministries, how people's relationships are going to be kind of upended in that process. There's no room for conversation. Have any of you ever been in a situation like this where somebody just comes in and makes wholesale changes? Right ends, wrong means, typically. We see this in our politics all the time. So, we're headed into this season. The season's already, you know, begun at least a little bit. But you have a candidate with great ideas about how to make things better. But in order to get there, they've got to win an election. And everybody knows that in order to win, there might be things that you've got to do in order to get to the goal. And that might be, you know, bending the truth about your opponents. It might be playing to people's fears. It might be taking money from people that you'd rather not be taking money from. And we're tempted to justify it if this person is somebody that we agree with to say, well, you know, that's what it takes in order to achieve the greater good because you got to get elected in order to do anything. And furthermore, you know that the other person is going to do it anyway, so what's the difference? Or maybe there's an example that's a little bit closer to home how often have you seen someone who places a high value on hard work, a high value on being successful, invest themselves so entirely in that work that they sacrifice a connection with their families, that they sacrifice relationships, that they sacrifice their connection to God? The hard thing about doing the right thing as Christians is that It's not enough to do what's right. It's hard to do what's right, don't get me wrong. But what makes it even harder is it's not enough just to do what's right. For Christians, it's the right thing, the right way, and for the right reasons. The right thing, the right way, for the right reasons. And that's why the values that we hold the things that we choose to prioritize are so incredibly important because for us it is not enough just to do what's right. As hard as that is, it's not enough. 
Jesus over and over again talked about how God prioritized what's internal, what's inside us. Talked about that as the place where everything negative flows from. Begins with our thoughts. Begins with our understandings of other people. Begins with our understandings of God. And when those are somewhat distorted, our actions will invariably also be distorted. And that's why the things that we believe, the values that we hold, the priorities that we set with, within our relationships with God and with other people are incredibly important, the most important things. And so there's no way to talk about a spiritual reset without talking also about reevaluating our values and making sure that our values are aligned with what God wants for us and that we're adhering to them. And so the letter of Galatians <clears throat> gives us an important insight about this relative to the church. It gives us insight into this time early in the history of the church when our values were tested, our values as Christians. And the evaluation that was made was that our values needed to be reset. So this letter is something that Paul wrote to Christian communities that he founded during his missionary journeys. So Paul undertook several trips all around the Mediterranean, and in those trips he stopped in different places, preached to different people, and established churches. And these were people that he had visited, that he'd preached the gospel to, that he felt invested in, people who felt invested also in him. Paul goes on to talk about in this letter how much they had helped him. And so he feels a close connection for the people in Galatia. But it's clear when you read the whole letter that his relationship with them is in a bit of turmoil, that there's tension because after he first shared the gospel with them, between the time when he wrote this when, between the time when he shared the gospel and the time when this letter was written, something happened. The gospel that he shared was somewhat undermined by people, by teachers who came in later and preached some things that were directly contradictory to some of the things that he had taught. There was a key debate that was happening in the early church about whether Christianity was going to be kind of a sect within Judaism or whether it was going to be something entirely new. And while there were Jewish Christians, of course there were Jewish Christians, because Jesus himself was Jewish, the earliest disciples were Jewish, there were a few practices that would have put a serious damper on evangelization efforts. And in particular, one was the circumcision of men. This put a serious damper on evangelization efforts, as you might guess. But it was understood that if you wanted to be Jewish, this was something that was necessary. It was absolutely fundamental to that identity. And so this question of whether or not you had to keep the law, whether or not in order to be a Christian you had to first be a Jew, that was a fundamental question that the church had to sort out. And so this was hotly debated as missionaries, including Paul, preached the gospel throughout the empire this question of whether converts needed to keep the law in its entirety. So Paul, even though he was a Pharisee, even though he was a scholar and an expert in the law, he very clearly came down on the side of, no, it's absolutely not necessary. And as evidence, he pointed to the idea that the people that he was preaching to, they experienced a transformation in their hearts and in their lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. He saw the Spirit in them. And when he saw the Spirit in them, he said, these people have been given the gift of God, the same as me, and therefore, I don't need to ask anything more of them because God has already been at work in their hearts and in their lives. But the people who came later they kept preaching a different gospel, which said that, no, the Spirit was not enough. You also needed to obey the rules. And so all of Galatians is basically a frustrated Paul saying over and over again, you were given the Spirit, so live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. 
And there were two values at stake here, two really important values. And the first being the question of how wide open the gospel was going to be. A really important question. Whether this good news was actually going to be good news for all people or just some people. The second question was whether or not we were going to prioritize faith, the practice of faith, of trust in God and trust in the Spirit, or whether we were going to practice or whether we were going to prioritize outward observance. The question was whether or not we really believed what Jesus had said, that it's what's inside that's most important. And the reality is that this question, this decision that was settled, was the most critical one that the early church faced. Because if you think about it, unless you came to Christianity, unless you came to your faith through Judaism, then you, like me, are a recipient of the blessings that were contained in this decision to make this something that was open for all people. Every one of us who are here, our presence can be directly traced to a decision that's recounted in Acts chapter 15, when leaders of the church gathered together, talked about, debated, argued about this question, and came down on the side that said, no, we believe the gospel should be for all people. It was a moment when we reset our values we reset our priorities. We preach the gospel throughout the world precisely because we came to believe that all people should hear this good news without any sort of impediment to their ability to embrace it, so that all people might come to know God through Jesus Christ. Resetting our values and resetting our priorities can be the most difficult thing because it requires us to change the way that we think about everything. And let's be honest, this question of who is in and who is out is still one that is operative today. It's operative because there are still people trying to steal our signs every time I turn around, right? It's still an operative question. The story, though, of what happened in the early church, this decision to embrace the idea that the gospel is for all people, to follow the leading of the Spirit. This led to ministry that changed the lives of first thousands, and then millions, and then billions, and billions of people. When the mission, though, seems to have faltered, it might be time to revisit this question. Do we need to reset our values? We live in a moment when millions of people in the U.S. in particular feel completely abandoned by the church. We live in a time when the fastest growing religious group are people we call the nuns and not people who wear habits, right? that are black and white, but nuns being people who have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Is this a moment for us to reestablish our values and our priorities? What's the Spirit saying to us about the ways in which we've gotten our priorities wrong? Paul has a lot of practical advice in this passage that at first feels kind of contradictory carry one another's burdens, but test your own work. Okay. Correct those who have gone astray, but do so with a spirit of gentleness. Okay. Work for the good of all, but especially for those of the household of faith. Okay. Treat each other as most important but recognize that you're no better than anybody else. Okay. These things all feel very contradictory. 
they all feel like they don't belong together. But that's actually one of the dimensions of the gospel that's 100% true, is that most of the things that we believe are paradoxical. I might summarize what I hear Paul saying like this. I love the way, by the way, that Sarah summarized it in these three movements. Here's how I might summarize this. Serve others and not yourself. But judge yourself and not others. Serve yourself. No. Serve others and not yourself. Judge yourself and not others. Which I see as being entirely consistent with the way that Jesus approached his life and ministry. And isn't the life and teaching of Jesus the place where we look to draw our values from? Because Jesus, the people that he judged were the people who set themselves up as being superior. Those were the people that Jesus judged. Pretty much the only people that Jesus judged. Priorities. Values. Is it time for us to do a reset? And what's true for the church is also true for us personally. When our lives don't make sense to us anymore, when it seems like the things that we've been trying to fix whatever situation has gone wrong in our career, in our life, in our marriage, in our sobriety, when it seems like those things have gone wrong, isn't it time for us to reevaluate our values? Have we prioritized the wrong things? Have we minored in faith rather than majoring in it? How is it that we are living? Because the hard thing about being a Christian is that it's not enough. As hard as it is, it's not enough just to do the right thing. It's the right thing done the right way for the right reasons. Serve others and not yourself. Judge yourself and not others. It's hard to hold all these things together. But when we feel stuck in the church, in life, when it feels like the things that we've been doing aren't working anymore, maybe it's because we've spent a lot of time looking at what we do and how we do it rather than digging deeper to the why do we do it at all. My challenge to you this week is to look again at the things that Jesus valued, the things that he felt were important. And the way you get down to that is by going back and looking at what he said and what he did. In particular, if you want to dive deeply into that, I invite you to take a look at Matthew's gospel, at Luke's gospel. Because sometimes we need to reset our priorities to make sure that they're in line with what God wants for us. Let's pray together. God, we know that it is a hard thing for us to follow Jesus. We know that there are moments when it feels incredibly difficult to choose the right thing and even more difficult to be attentive to doing the right things for the right reasons. We pray that this week we might not be afraid of those moments of prayer that we spend with you, those moments of reflection or we think about our own lives, we think about what we're doing when we evaluate them against the things that we see in Jesus' life and Jesus' teaching. We pray that you might be at work in us this week so that we might come to a deeper understanding of how to reset our values so that they might be in line with what you want for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.